Look at that. <laughs> in, this, in the second game of tonight's ESPN doubleheader, Andre Drummond expected to make his Lakers debut against the Bucks. Lakers, of course, currently fourth in the West, five games ahead of that play-in scenario, which is really the line for them, Ramona, until they get AD and LeBron back. What are your expectations for Drummond's debut tonight? Well, I think he's going to play a lot, Rach. I think he's going to be effective because he's going to be excited to be out there for the first time in a couple months here. Um, they, you know, he, they're excited about him. He had a good practice. He's in shape. So I know he hasn't been playing, but he's in shape and he's ready to go. Um, he's a little rusty. You know, he's going to have to get back that touch around the rim and he's going to have to get that touch back out there. But he's excited to be out there. I think the bigger question for me is just chemistry-wise, like what does this do to Marcus Gasol? I mean, that's a proud that's a proud guy out there who's giving up a starting spot here because this is what they needed to do to get Andre Drummond. And it's, you know, Marcus all goes to the bench now. And he has not had a great year for the Lakers by by his standards, by their standards. He's coming back from a bout of COVID. That was tough for him. But this is not what he signed up for in LA. And Frank Vogel's got a job on his hands of managing that. What do you think, Robert, of that chemistry issue? And we know that Mark is, you know, he's he's normally a good get along kind of guy, but he's a guy who's also, you know, done a lot of things in this league. Yeah, it gets it gets to a point in the league where you understand your role. And as a player, you want what's best for the team. And Mark's that type of guy. He knows what's best for this team is for him to step aside. He knows he's not playing well. He's still not in shape from that COVID episode. So mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, this will give him time to really focus on his body. You know, this is time we can go get extra conditioning to be ready because you're gonna need Mark. So you're going to need his outside presence because we know LeBron loves playing with him. He loves his ability to see the game because we always talk, he always talks about his IQ. So with him on the floor, he makes the people, LeBron and AD, much better. You know, if this season in particular, and especially this moment in the season has taught us anything, look at all the injuries to the top players. Right. Look at the injuries to, you know, you've seen it with Joel Embiid, LeBron and AD and Steph being out. You've seen it so much. So you need guys. You need bodies. Now, you know, if you allow Mark to relax and get himself back into shape, like you're going to get an opportunity to play. This has happened to every player that I've ever played with that understands roles and what your opportunities are. Some days you'll be in the lineup, some days you won't. If you look at last year in the postseason, you know, Dwight and certain guys played in certain right. series, they didn't play another series. So it's all about your skill set and what you bring. The worst thing that Marcus all could do is be upset, be frustrated, allow himself to get out of shape, but he's a professional. This is what he's going to do. And I think he probably saw this coming he's had conversations before Drummond signed he was like hey what's going on and it's like look I want what's best for the team are you okay with that should we waive you allow you to go someplace else if you're going to be upset that wasn't a case so I believe that he's on board and when we look at Andre Drummond Ramona mm -hmm. obviously the Lakers went after him pretty hard didn't get the trade going for Kyle yeah. Lowry that they were interested in can you take us behind the scenes at all how did they pitch him and, and how did he end up picking there because you know he had other places that he could have gone Look, this is a showcase for him. He is a rental. And I know he said, I hope it's for longer than this year. But if you if you know how the salary cap works and the hard cap works, like unless he wants to play for a vet minimum next year, which he is worth a lot more than a vet minimum, yeah. or even that $9 million exception that, that, that all, all those teams have, I mean, he's worth a lot more than that. So this is an audition for him to show what he can do on a winning team. He has not been in a situation like this before in his NBA career. I think he's really happy to be here, really excited. And he turned down roles with teams that have more money to pay him in the offseason to be in Los Angeles. And the, and the way the Lakers got him, they essentially said, you're going to be a star our starting center. You're going to play a lot of minutes. You're going to be able to showcase yourself in a winning situation. And he had to kind of look within himself and say, do I care more about the money? Do I care more about establishing myself in a place where maybe they could resign me, where they have the money to do that? Or do I care more about putting myself on a championship team, contending for, for a title like, like he never has before? Um, and does that establish your value more, in the, in, especially if he's going to be starting and playing a lot of minutes? He asked himself, do I want to spend part of the winter in Los Angeles after spending <laughs> winters in Cleveland and Detroit? I mean, these are the questions that go through a man's mind. Let's Wrong, Perk. That's yeah. the reality of it. And I know if you're watching Richard somewhere in your sweatpants, maybe you're still wearing a jacket because you're just weird <laughs> like that. Perk was wrong. All-star game. And you know what? To all the Warriors fans, if Steph Curry do decide to leave, y'all can't be mad at him. He didn't give y'all franchise everything in the world and more, okay? But I'm just thinking of the, the fact that I could possibly see, the world could see LeBron James, one of the greatest of all time, the goat in my eyes, Steph Curry, the greatest shooter of all time, top five point guard of all time, along with a generation of Anthony Talent and Anthony Davis pairing up in Los Angeles together, that would be must-see TV. And look, hey, 
I'm not knocking Braun for doing it. Not what I'm saying going down in Brooklyn right now. I mean, hey, you know, this part of it. Stack the team up. Stack the deck. Well, Stack let, the deck. Let, let me start with you, Perk, about that. I think one of the greatest things about LeBron beyond, obviously, how great he is on the floor, right, is that he's willing to put bygones aside, right? Like, they were fierce competitors against each other. You know you were in those battles as well, and he doesn't care about that stuff. When it comes to business, he wants to put the best team around him possible, and that's that's actually really smart. Absolutely, George. And look, one thing that, one word that don't, don't match LeBron James is the word sensitive, right? He takes a lot of heat. He never lashes out. He never gives any type of backlash to media or says anything that anybody have negative to say about him. He keeps pushing forward. So, you know, at the end of the day, hey, look, Braun, do you, right? We all know that him and Steph Curry had the battles, but I do remember when Steph Curry was in college, LeBron James was going to his college games and watching them play. So LeBron knows how to turn that on and off switch on to separate the two between the lines and outside the lines. Let me let me tell you something about LeBron. If, unless you're <laughs> part of a very small select group of players, and Perk is in that group, but it's a small select group of players, you are either with LeBron or you're against him. If you're with him today, you're his buddy. If you're against him tomorrow, you're his enemy. Very, very few escape that sphere. Perk is a guy he always liked, but you don't want to know why? Because he played with Perk when he was in high school, okay? He goes all the way back to a teenager with Perk. It's a very small number. So yeah, he was a fierce rival of Steph Curry uh, four or five years ago for five years. If there's a window of an opportunity, 1%, 2%, that he can get Steph Curry on the Lakers, he's going to be his buddy. And if he re-signs with the Warriors and it closes the door, he'll be his enemy again. Just like a couple of years ago when Kyrie Irving was going to be a free agent, he made up with him for like three, four months. Then Kyrie goes, <laughs> now he's his enemy again. This is how LeBron rolls. He's been rolling like this for 15 or 18 years, and it will not change. And this is just another file. He's going to try to get Steph. If he doesn't get him, we'll try to get somebody else. Yeah. For sure. Now, let me ask you about the Lakers' current point guard situation with Dennis Schroeder. Uh, the Lakers allegedly offered him a, a deal, Brian, and he turned that deal down. What do we know about that? Talk about Andre Drummond. All signs to him. All signs point to him making his Lakers debut tonight. What are reasonable expectations for him in his first game in nearly seven weeks? Ramona Shelburne is going to join us to discuss that. But first, so... Who are the Denver Nuggets? Are they really the fifth best team in the West, like the standing show? Or with an MVP candidate in Nikola Jokic and some splashy trade deadline moves, are they legit title contenders? And, and by the way, I don't mean title contenders in some in the conversation way. I mean, can you actually see them knocking off, say, the Nets or the defending champion Lakers? E even when you look backward to the bubble, it's hard to know exactly who the Nuggets were then. Were they the team that made it to the conference finals, one of the last two standing in a loaded West? Or were they were the team that last year came within, what, a, a quarter inch of being knocked out of the first round by that Mike Conley shot that just rimmed out at the Game 7 buzzer? You know, normally we can find out who a team is with some measuring stick games. You know, those big matchups over the course of a season that let us get a sense of the league's hierarchy. I except right now, with all of this season's injury and COVID absences, those games are hard to come by. Take last night when the Nuggets welcomed the Sixers to town. And yeah, Philadelphia sits atop the East standings. And in theory, this should have been a game for Denver to really see what it was made of. Except that Joel Embiid was still out, which meant no MVP showdown between him and Jokic, or really not much of a showdown anywhere at all. The Nuggets led 44-22 to 22 after just the first quarter. And while the game would get closer in spots, it was never really close. Afterward, Doc Rivers gave this evaluation of his team. There's so many areas where we are bad. Uh, for me to try to point out one um, would be unfair to the other bad areas we were. So... We just had an awful game. We didn't have many of those, but tonight was one of them. The positive is that the, the, the uh, clock finally expired. That was one very good positive. <laughs> Love, Doc. All right, things were much more chippy in the Denver locker room, especially around Jamal Murray, who seemed to feed off the Nuggets' first game with fans in the stands to deliver a really fun 30-point night. Murray showed off the whole package, some beautiful passes, some eye-popping ball handling, series of step-back threes. 
But of course, we don't really know what it means. Yeah, it's encouraging that Murray has seemed to emerge from his early season funk, but which version of him will Denver get in the playoffs? And what about Michael Porter Jr., who had a 27-point night himself? Take a look at MPJ in his last 20 games. He's averaged 19 points, 8.8 rebounds, while shooting 57% from the field, 51% from deep. Will he continue to grow into the players the Nuggets projected he'd be? And what about Aaron Gordon, who, by the way, switched his number to 50 after the trade to Denver? In honor of the 50s, he thought he should have received for his two second place oh, finishes I love it. in the All-Star Dunk Contest. That is next level petty, Aaron. And we here at the Jump, Love it. We applaud you. Bear down. Gordon hasn't played enough with the Nuggets yet to know what he can truly be with that team. The assumption is he'll particularly help defensively, as will JaVale McGee, although the Nuggets are still the worst in the league when it comes to defending the rim, which could certainly be a problem come this postseason. All in all, the Nuggets have more questions than answers, and who knows? Maybe when it's all over, they'll have the answer. But to get there, they will have to figure out exactly who they are. And in this no-practice time, weird scheduled track meet of a season, that is a whole lot easier said than done. All right, it's time to bring back one of our new segments. Can I have a word, friends? So the Nuggets made some nice roster tweaks at the deadline, added Aaron Gordon, as I said, JaVale McGee. So this is a team that is looking to be right there at the end of the season. Friends, countrymen, Romans, Robert. Can I have a word for what the new look Nuggets, what their chances are in the West? Uh, it's been upgraded. Okay. It was kind of bleak there for a minute, but they've been upgraded from maybe a seven to eight seed to maybe a four or five seed. It's still not that great because you still have Jamal Murray trying to find his way. I know everybody's looking at Aaron Gordon to be the savior, but I still don't think he's that defensive presence like they used to have with Grant. So he's he's an energy guy, but he doesn't have that defensive presence. You just said it. They allow a lot of points in the paint, and we know King James scores a lot of points in the paint. AD scores a lot of points, and that's who you're trying to defend against and they don't have it yet all right Get i said <laughs> respectable right when we're talking you about just wanted the, the word respectable next to your face on tv probably but everyone knows that this is some <laughs> joke thing if there's like a screenshot of this but no i just think to your point like the the areas that they were deficient were you know athletic wing they mm -hmm. needed another big but but you know i think their chances are respectable i i could see them upsetting somebody i could see them making a similar run but are they a championship team? They still have to go out and change some of their effort. Okay. Because you just mentioned just the Lakers. We're not even talking about, like, let's say the Utah, and you got Rudy Gobert, and you got Donovan Mitchell in the paint. Then you go and you look at, you know, if you go to the East, you got Joel Embiid. Then you got, you got Giannis. Like, you have to protect the paint. And if you are one of the worst teams at protecting the paint, there's just too many great teams down the line that are great at attacking that it's going to be a problem, but their chances are respectable. Hmm. All right. And by the way, I want to shout out Katie Bummer for our beautiful signs. Oh. Lovely. <laughs> I did not write this. I want to move on. To, your handwriting is nowhere near that good. No. I want to move on to the Phoenix Suns, who took care of business at home last night against the Hawks. Most people expected to see the Suns improve this season, but Guys, they've done more than that, as they are currently second in the standings in a stacked Western Conference. The Suns have won 24 of their last 30 games, have not lost consecutive games since January. They are leading the league in field goal percentage in that span. So, Richard, can I have a word for the Suns winning 24 out of 30? The word is, and again, we're talking about names in front of our faces, but <laughs> premature. Okay. Uh, the reason why I think it's premature is because when you look at I appreciate the chuckle. Uh, the reason why is because you look at their team and the way it's constructed. Like, we, Utah fans and Utah people are critical that we're not giving them enough credit. And it's like, well, you haven't proven anything. And I think Utah has proven a lot more than this Suns team has over the past few years of growth. And so I just think that with only Chris Paul and, I, and Jay Crowder really having playoff experience, it, like, it's premature for us to jump on that bandwagon, but they are great. It's great to see the Suns relevant. It's from my in my hometown, so I, I'm excited, but it's premature to get really excited about them. I thought you'd be extremely excited, but <laughs> I really couldn't come up with one word, and I came up with CP3. I mean, that's always a good that's fallback. That's all you need right there. Is <laughs> that a word? It is today. It is. <laughs> he has seven rings. If he says it's a word, we accept that it's a word. That's how this show works. This is what you have to understand. You need a 
type of guy like CP3 to get you in order. This is a leader. He is a true leader on this basketball court. We all know the Phoenix Suns had all type of talent. You know they can shoot the ball, but it needs someone to bring them together. You need that glue. CP3 has always been that guy to bring a team together. Lob City, James Harden over there in Houston. If he went in towards, uh, pulled his hamstring, he could have been in the finals. There's so many things that get disrespected by CP3. At the end of the day, this guy is a leader. He knows how to get everyone in that locker room on board. So CP3. Look, his effect on bigs in particular, the way he's improved DeAndre Aiden, even in ways that don't show up in the stat sheet, that's a pick that the Suns made over Luka Doncic, right? So you want to maximize him as much as you can. Maybe he will not be a Luka-level player, but it is important that you take a guy who was a number one pick and make him better, and Chris Paul can do that, and that has been part yeah, of well, success, and, along and, with Devin Booker. And again, I know so many times we focus on the Luka thing, which is correct because he looks like a generational player, but it's because the Kings had De'Aaron Fox, who was close to being an all-star, was in the all-star conversation, and 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 uh, the Phoenix Suns had Devin Booker, who has been an all-star the last you two years. You don't think Luka and Booker would been, I'm uh, not saying that they would have, but it's like in can. hindsight, sometimes <laughs> when you look at it, yeah. not drafting Michael Jordan, you had Clyde Drexler. <laughs> yeah. Like you understand why these yes. moves are made. You're trying to address position versus like just pure talent. Well, so, I would argue in the positionless era now, yeah. it yeah. is different than in the Jordan era. Yeah. And, and I'm not, by the way, I'm not trying to turn this into an Aiton versus Luca thing. My point is you want to max, you picked Aiton. Aiton is the one who's there. Mm. He is a good young man. He is, he is a player who keeps trying to get better and you want a guy like Chris. Cleat him like <laughs> <laughs> For you to de him is pretty impressive. He's a crazy fun player to watch. Like all of this stuff, the linebacker stuff, it's it's great. He's really fun. Great passing. All right, make Fury. Game out of reach here, but Russ still throwing down in angry tomahawks. Rob, I don't know where he ranks in terms of angry dunkers for you. Number but. one for me. You know, uh, if you go with Duncan Stein, Daryl Dawkins, and all these guys, but this guy, when he attacks the rim, you're like, man, who are you mad at? Why are you doing this? Like, <laughs> Everybody. Like, like, the guy on the knees is just, no, just get out of the way, man. Just get out of the way because this guy, when he has that takeoff platform right here, it's just, whoo. Well, that's what we man. talking about, that one, too. And there is... There is nobody that size that is more aggressive. You would even yeah. probably go two or three more inches up. And then you're having a conversation with him. You're supposed to run out the arena when you get dunked on like this. You don't have a conversation <laughs> with him like this. What's wrong with him? <laughs> Guys nowadays are too friendly, and man. we start Ooh. saying that, everyone starts <laughs> complaining. So I just stay away from that conversation and just say, yeah, it was sad. That was just sad. <laughs> Let's run it back to Russell Westbrook's angriest dunks ever. You know this is going to be good. Number five, 2012. Russ against the Warriors. Take a look at this. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, oh. oh, you know oh we got the music behind it. Music. Let's you hear the music behind it? Okay. Stare down, though. How are you going to see a guy coming at you like this? Stare you in your eyes and just raise up. Robbie's what, what soul. Duh. And what's so crazy, this is what's so crazy about him. Him and Kyrie are like an inch apart. And They're yes. the same like height and just looking like the way they play and this dominate differently. This is 2014, Russ in Detroit. Mm. <laughs> Here we go. Like, are we gonna show the lob? The rest oh. of the team too. Look at these guys on the back on the bench going nuts. What? As a big, you guys, I'm mad at you, man. Stop him. Yeah. They can pick it up early. You coming into my area? Josh Smith was still in the league. 2014 <laughs> playoffs in San Antonio. This is number three. Look at that. <laughs> it's so good. You just don't, again, there's just not that many guys that dunk that hard, that aggressively. That's on top of Kawhi. And, then, and the San Antonio fans love their team beyond no other. And look, they're respecting this dunk like, wow. Mm. Number two, 2017 tries to rip the rim down versus the Bucks. He got a technical on that one, and it's okay. <laughs> you should, it's okay yeah, to get a technical. Tech, tech. Take that tag. Some dunks you have to take a tag. You gotta have a little nasty with yep. you. Mm -hmm. Let them know. Let's try it again. Team. Try it again. I'll do it again. Yep. That's what you say. Yep. <laughs> try that block again. Ooh. I'll do it again. <laughs> oh, Oof. poor. Just. I'm glad he didn't injure that small child baseline. Do we have tombstones built for all these guys. This Number one. Yeah. This is my favorite one. This is my favorite one. KD. That lob. Oof. See, I still like the ones where he attack on his own. Cross the one up. Just Go look at this. Frame. Look at how. I know he has the duck. Look at this. Kiss the ring. Look at that. Cool. 
<laughs> Richard, I like when you when you're the one sort of you know geeking out over dunks since we know what kind of dunker you. Well, were. but l- l- look because you understand the timing, the athleticism, and even then, like I was a big just flush guy. Like mm-hmm. don't touch the rim, don't hang on the rim. But he just goes and tries to rip the rim off, and he does a pretty good job of it. And there, there you go. Good. All right, I want to switch gears slightly. According to our own Adrian Wojnarowski, Boogie Cousins and the Clippers are discussing a possible 10-day contract. Now, no decision is expected for a few days. However, Richard, do you like the idea of Boogie going to the Clips? Remember, he played with a lot. You know, he played with Rondo in Sacramento and New Orleans, right? Played with yeah, Rondo. no, I, I, I like the idea of it mainly because you need size. All of a sudden, <laughs> randomly, size has started becoming a premium. In <laughs> Return to the big man. All of a sudden, it was, it was, you know. A bunch of guards, but now you look around this league, and you're going to have to play Jokic. You're going to have to play LeBron, AD, and Drummond. Yep. You're going to have to play against Lopez and Giannis. You're going to have to play against Embiid if you want to win a championship. So now, surprisingly, size has become a premium. And I think, as much as I love Zubac, mm-hmm. I, I, I like Serge. I think adding more bodies is always a positive thing. Well, we know Serge has kind of drifted outside the three-point line. Yeah. You need someone in that paint. And Boogie is that guy that can get you points in the paint, offensive rebounds, you know, those second-chance second, second chance points that you need. But we know this guy also brings a little nasty when he yeah. comes to this game. So if you come to that paint, uh-huh. you're going to be getting up off the floor, old-school yeah. style. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, look, you were talking just earlier about the Clippers and, and sort of in the clutch and trying to find who they are as a team. You bring Rajon Rondo in. We know what he brings sort of locker room-wise and, again, nasty-wise and all of that stuff. You bring a guy like Boogie Cousins in if he's able to stick. You're kind of changing a little bit of the personality of that team again in a way that hopefully sets you up for a championship. Yeah, yeah. and Zubak is one of the most underrated bigs in this league, Mm -hmm. right? He can shoot free throws well. Great hands, skilled, doesn't say much, but then all of a sudden you look up at the end of the day and he's got 12 and 10. He's got 15 and 9. Like, he just is a great complimentary big. But I just think in the more bigs you have, especially ones that have, like, some presence, I think it's never I, a bad thing. I also thing. think that Zubak needs to learn how to file hard. When you're that big, mm-hmm. you need to file hard and make people scared of you. Nobody's scared of Responsibility and all this. Here's what he had to say. From our standpoint and in that locker room, um, you know, it's kind of, it's not his job per se to, I feel like, get us riled up, you know, those games where we come out kind of slow. You know, we're all professionals. We've all been playing basketball for a long time. You know, his job is to have us prepared. And, you know, you really can't coach energy, you know, in those days when, you know, in those games where we didn't have this start and we dug ourselves a hole and had to try to come back. Um, you know, we, we got to take ownership. We got to, you know, do better in that aspect. So Jason Tatum putting some of that on himself. But, Robert, where are you on the coach versus anyone else for the Celtics' struggles right now? And coaches get blamed for so many things in this league, and sometimes they should. But in this case, he shouldn't be blaming it all because they had COVID cases. They had a lot of injuries. You had smart out when you you, you, you energy guys. And that's the key to a team. If you don't have your energy guy, then you're going to go out there and you're going to play like a desical. You have these things. And think about it. Tatum got COVID, and he was going through about six about six weeks where he said, I'm just not in shape. Still? He says yeah. he still doesn't have all yes. his win back. And that's the whole thing. And the only player on this team that's really been consistent is Jalen Brown. And he's the go-to guy that's been durable and a key guy for them. And then they had trades. It's so many things that happened this season. You can go on and on. But you cannot blame the coach because he's a hell of a coach. Yeah, no, he, he's a hell of a coach. And this is my issue. We, you, you, know, you look at Greg Popovich with San Antonio for the last 20 years. Every year they weren't a one seed. Every year they weren't a two seed. Every right. like we we were the seven seed and we beat the two seed. You're going to have years where they're great, years where they're not. You can't sit here and blame the coach. And look, ultimately, this team doesn't have championship talent. They have two studs, they have yeah. two stars, and they have other good talent around them. What would they, they do for Al Horford? Studs. Haven't they been in the Eastern Conference studs. Finals three of the last four years? Well, that's what I, but this is what I'm saying. Right? But I don't believe that this team's talent stacks up with the other top teams. They don't stack up with Brooklyn. They don't stack up with, with uh, Philly, and I don't think they stack up with Milwaukee. So when you look at those teams, they're, they're kind of hovering talent-wise where they are despite all of the other things. That's so some of the coach, but not enough to change them or to complain or put them on the hot seat. He's a great coach and great coaches are hard to find. Ramona, there were really mixed projections on the Celtics heading into this season. You had people up and down the board saying, oh, I can see them top three in the East. I can see them kind of where they are right now, seventh, eighth in the East. How is this all playing in Boston? Because we know that Celtics fans, we know that Celtics yeah. ownership, their expectations are in that top tier. And as I just mentioned, they've been in the Eastern Conference Finals three of the last four years. 
they did not expect to be taking such a step backward this season. Yeah, this is a this is a big step backwards, but you also have to go back to the offseason. I mean, their big acquisitions are Tristan Thompson and Jeff Teague. That has not worked out. <laughs> they never replaced Gordon Hayward. Um, you have to look at Danny Ainge in the front office and say, you know, they don't have a lot of depth. They haven't added a lot. They haven't added a lot to that roster, and they lost a lot, quite frankly, when they lost Gordon Hayward for nothing, except for a trade exception, which they really didn't use mm -hmm. um, in any meaningful way. And and I think when you look at this team, J Jason Tatum just told you what it, what's going on with them. Okay, when you use words like effort. When you, use, when you say the coach can't get us riled up, that's him saying it's on us. We are not playing with energy. And if you watch the Celtics a lot this year, mm -hmm. they, they have to go to zone defense sometimes. Yeah. They have to do that. They, they can't even play man defense because they're not the, either. It's, some of its defense is effort, especially man defense is effort. Um, and when you're not bringing that night in and night out, then you have to do whatever you got to do. And I think Brad's actually done a pretty decent job managing a roster where Kemba Walker's been in and out. He doesn't play in back-to-backs as they manage that knee injury. Marcus Smart's been out. And going back to that word effort, that's their guy every night that brings effort. That's their energizer.